lifting to failure is probably killing your gains. Ooh, uh, let's boy, you're going to piss some what? people off. Boy, are we just on this kick right now of just defend everybody? I right? know. We're like, punching everybody in the gut. We well, got all the cardio queens after us right now on YouTube. Cardio queen. Oh, now now you're going to get all the, the bodybuilder intensity, yeah. you know, failure guys that are getting spotting uh, spots on every one of their lifts. Yeah. Like, you're going to piss all them off. No, you know, here's There's okay. a study that shows this. I know. Okay, so here's the deal. For, mm-hmm. First off, to explain failure lifting, what that means is you lift the weight until you fail, right? You can't lift the weight anymore. Now, there's a, always a debate. Do you fail on technique and form, or do you fail when you just can't move the weight anymore? Whatever. Either way, um, it's too much intensity most of the time for most people. That's the problem. And there are studies that show that there's benefits. But studies are always you know, 8 to 12 weeks long. Temporary. Exactly. And if when you train to failure, it is not – even though you reduce the volume – uh, of your training to make up for that intensity, it really does fry the body in a different way. Well, when we talked about the workout partner thing, uh, this is kind of what came to mind for me because I do, re- I wish I remember the exact study, but I do remember reading a study that talked about the benefits of training to failure mm-hmm. and uh, and its benefits as far as muscle growth. Mm-hmm. And after reading that, that, that's all I needed to hear. Like, okay, I need to be doing negatives <clears throat> and a workout partner who's taking me to failure. And this entire every- modality is devoted to just like ramping that intensity up to a really high level. Yeah. Right? And so it was, I was stuck in this kind of trap for a very long time, at least a decade of training uh, looked like uh, every exercise that I did, um, I definitely did at least one set, if not every set, to failure. Um, and you know, if I wasn't struggling, then I didn't get a good workout. That mm-hmm. was my thought process, and that's also why I used to think that a workout partner was so valuable. Was you know, the only way I could take this thing to failure every time is if I got someone to yep. to help me out. And, yeah. And now, it, now the truth is that the failure training does and can produce some pretty significant results. The problem is nobody programs it properly um, and failure training should be used appropriately. And I would argue by people who really understand technique, form, stability, and know their bodies. Because when you go to failure, the risk of injury does go up. That's just the bottom line. Just the amount of intensity that you're putting your body through. Because here's the thing when you train to failure, if you don't ever do it and you try it, it's further than you think. Like you'll get to a rep and be like, oh my God, I think I have one more. Then you'll do it and be like, oh my God, I have another one. And you'll keep going. And when your form starts to break down, oftentimes it's the weak link that breaks down, which dramatically increases the the, the risk of injury. And, and for most people going to failure, not only is it not necessary, but it tends to set them back. And, and so with clients, I mean, let me ask you guys this, with your clients, did you ever train when you were good? At, but forget when you sucked as a trainer, when you started getting good. <laughs> did you ever train clients to failure? No, ever? No, no, rarely ever. Do you guys remember what it was that shattered your paradigm? I remember. It was actually when I, because I had no interest really in power lifting or Olympic lifting, and I really didn't follow that. That's yeah. probably more Justin and maybe even you. Yeah. Um, that I didn't really pay attention to their programming and training until way later. And I was shocked that, the strongest people in the world, yeah. like never trained to failure. I yep. mean, like literally hardly ever trained to failure. Like they're trained. And not only that, like but 60 to 70%. Yeah. Intensity. Their, their intensity was even way, way. It was, you talk about the, we talk about uh, two reps in the tank all the time. Yep. Right. So we, we, we promote that. Like that's what most people should train for is having two reps left in the tank in their sets. And that's like what Olympic lifters and power lifters train like 80% of the time. It's not until they get, like to their peak or getting ready to get into a meet, yep. do they test those limits, you know? And I, I thought that was so crazy. And I was like, how funny is this that you have all these weekend warriors or gym bros that are lifting and we're all using spotters and you got this, man, you got this, and we're training this way. And yet the the strongest, most muscular people on the planet, when you talk about you know, power lifters and Olympic lifters, are never training that way. Or like you're talking about a 5% of the time they are are training this way, it completely just yeah, shattered you, my paradigm. You tend to hear yeah. training to failure from bodybuilders, but even if we use, and, and I, you know, I don't necessarily like using bodybuilders or elite athletes as examples because what we're dealing with is a very, it's a very rare, um, you know, portion of the population with genetics that are on the extreme end. I mean, it's really no different than people who are over seven feet tall. It's so rare in real life. You know, you walk around in real life, you know, you never see anybody that's over seven feet tall. 
that's how rare the type of genetics are. Well, that, it's not just that either, though, Sal. I mean, when you're talking about that community, uh, a big portion of them, especially the ones that look amazing, are on anabolics. Then you throw that on top and of then, it. And then I tell you what, one of the biggest things that I notice uh, from taking testosterone for as long as I did, uh, the one of the best things was the recovery ability. Of course. I mean, strength, yeah, that's cool, but you're eventually your body kind of adapts to that and you start hitting your peaks yeah, anyways. Yeah, you throw shit at your body and you don't really get sore. Yeah, and I, and I don't really get that sore anymore. So that it's not like strength just keeps going up forever as long as you're on you know steroids. What was amazing, though, was the recovery ability. Yes. Was that I could throw anything at my body and destroy it, and my body had this ability to recover yes, and get but back. Yes, but uh, genetics, the extreme genetics plus that, right. produces this insane uh, situation. And so taking advice from that, you know, category of people, you have to be very careful. I would say you'll get some answers if you look at all of them and kind of look at trends, but you're not going to get a, all the answers. But here's some clues, right? If you look at the pro bodybuilders, the the, 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 the elite top muscle building people with the best genetics and of course on anabolics, and you look at the ones that train with the failure intensity model, what you tend to see is a high rate of injury. You tend to see, I mean, the most popular being Dorian Yates, right? Dorian Yates trained what he called heavy duty style training, where, or excuse me, not heavy duty, blood and guts was the name of his style of training. Drive it on! Oh, squeeze it down! Make it do nothing. Eat. Eat. Holy shit! Eat. 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 Hold it there! Let's do another one! Hold it! But it was borrowed off of heavy duty, which was invented by Mike Menser. And he had lots of injuries, right? Ronnie Coleman. trained with an incredible intensity, right? Mm -hmm. Tremendous amounts of injuries. Then you have bodybuilders that didn't train that way who had a lot of longevity. Dexter um, Jackson. Dexter Jackson being a great example of uh, of a bodybuilder. But, you know, so the risk of injury is very high. It does fry your central nervous system. It really does. Um, and the CNS needs time to recover, um, just like muscles do, if not more so. Now, I if I see a program with failure programmed in properly – then I would say this is good. But I never see that. I never see failure programmed improperly. Oh, right. It's almost <clears throat> always either the feature of the program mm -hmm. or, or or somehow it's the feature you know, where they talk about intensity and how hard, how hard you need to train. Um, but no, yeah, intensity is important, but going to failure is too much for most people. And now when did it change for me? I'll tell you. It changed for me. I want to say late twenties, maybe, um, and up until then, like you, I trained to failure quite often. I did the body part split, the whole thing, and then I started reading these old strength books that were written by people in the early nineteen hundreds, and I noticed they all trained full body three days a week. They looked incredible. This is before supplements were even invented. Really, forget anabolic steroids. And I thought, and then what they would write about in these books was. Uh, make sure that you save some energy, the way that they put it, right? Because they didn't say failure. They said, make sure you have enough energy to train the next workout. And mm -hmm. don't, you know, essentially it would say, don't beat up your body. And so I took it as, okay, if I'm training my whole body three days a week, going to failure, I know is going to crush me. Yeah. What if I stopped a few reps short of failure? And the gains I got were, literally within the first week, I saw my strength start to well, go up. Well, that's why I had the biggest epiphany was like measuring more so on how my next workout felt. And, you know, there's this whole thing like your, your body needs to heal, right? And so at some point, uh, you know, there's, the, there's healing or adapting. Like which one are you doing? There's a sweet spot there where if you're adapting and you go into your next workout, you feel stronger, you feel more energized. Mm -hmm. And if you've never felt that in a workout and you just felt almost dread, like you're grinding your way through every single workout, you got to assess, you know, that amount of uh, intensity you're bringing. Well, that's where it came full circle for me. So first it was r seeing the programming from power lifters and Olympic lifters. Then I remember like the first couple of times that I took like a, like being very consistent Consistent, like in hardcore training, right? And training intensely. And then I took like a, a week vacation. Matter of fact, we used every July, we had this 10 day vacation. We go up wakeboarding, and that was all I did. No, I wasn't lifting weights. I'm out in the trees in the lake. Like, 
And then I'd come back, you know, worried. I'm going to be, oh, my God, I've, all I did was eat candy and sit on a lake and, you know, lay, lay out and stuff like that. No training whatsoever. Sure, I was doing a little bit of cardiovascular stuff by doing wakeboarding, but not any strength training at all. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose all the strength. And I come back stronger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of when it was like that, that whole thing came together for me. It's like, what the hell? And it's like, oh, wow, maybe my body really needed to... <laughs> fully recover like that and now that i am fully recovered the my body is responding yeah. and i'm getting stronger that was when it all started to come together yeah, now here's what's interesting with failure training and this is where i think some people get sold when you do it for a short period of time you do gain strength and you do you can gain muscle in a very short period of time but it's very short-lived which well that's where the studies are built around yes that's there because if you were to especially if you never train a failure and then you do it like for a couple weeks, you see like, oh my gosh, I'm getting stronger and building muscle very, very quickly. That happened to me as a kid when I first picked up Heavy Duty by Mike Menser. And I was like, for the for a month, I saw these crazy gains. And of course, it all stopped and plateaued completely. So as a long-term approach, it's really terrible. And again, I think it's just never programmed appropriately or properly. And when people use failure, they use it all the time. It's just all about intensity. And, and so one of my favorite things to do uh, as an older trainer when I started to get real good is if I had a guy hire me who had worked out for a long time and I'd look at their workouts and I'd see that they trained to failure all the time, I would confidently say to this to them, I'd say, oh, I'll, I'll get you 10 to 15 pounds stronger on most of your lifts within a month. And they'd look at me like I was crazy. And I'd say, I'll refund you if it doesn't happen. You know what I would do? Yeah. Just have them not train to failure. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they'd see these crazy gains because <laughs> they were overdoing it before. You yeah. know, it's... it's um. It's tough. It, it plays with the ego a little bit, right? Because I remember uh, lifting. I mean, and, and I'm still guilty of this, right? I think we all are a little bit where you have a workout and uh, and you can just feel the weight like moving so easy. And yeah. it's like, oh, shit, this this 225, it's not a grind right now. It feels like it's moving up slow like, or uh, smooth. Oh, let me throw another quarter on there and see how that goes. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I've never lifted this. It's a PR for you in your workout. And then what do you want to do the next week? PR again. Yeah. Well, if that was if that was the best I've ever done, I mean, what what could be next week be? So it's it, you know it running with, as fast as you can into a brick wall. It, yeah, I mean. that's really uh, so. Um, th this isn't. I don't. I don't feel like this is us uh, pointing at everybody else and saying, "Oh, everybody's doing this wrong, and we're so right." Listen, I'm guilty of of doing this too. It's it's you know it's very uh, it feeds the ego when I when I get in there and get a lift and it's the the most I've ever done and it's very tempting to want to keep doing that yeah. to see to see where the end is and see wow how much stronger am I but. You know, and, and initially you may see that you may actually be able to do that back to back weeks and see gains and go, oh, my God, I am getting stronger. But it's really hard to do that and then go, OK, it's time for me to go the other direction. Like it's just, you're fighting with the ego. Yeah, totally. Hey, if you enjoyed that clip, you can find the full episode here or you can find other clips over here and be sure to subscribe.